Hey guys, Derek here from Back to Reality. And we've talked a lot on this channel over the past couple of years about the various growing techniques that we've been experimenting with in our garden. If you've been following along for a while, then you're no doubt familiar with the Ruth Stout method, Back to Eden, and Hugel Culture Mounds. We've done our best to provide step-by-step -step processes, give an honest look at our results, and most importantly, share any lessons that we've learned along the way. One of our primary goals has been to figure out what works and what doesn't, in order to hopefully save you some time if you're considering trying any of these techniques on your own. However, we've recently received a number of questions and comments that made us realize that we've left out a pretty important piece of the puzzle. For example, we're located in Ontario, Canada, but we know that many of you are in the US or South America, Europe, and Australia. We even get messages from some Asian and African countries as well. My point is, the world is a big place, and just because something works well here doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work as effectively somewhere else. So today, we're going to collect as many details as we can about the growing conditions in our part of the world and tell you how to do the same. That way you'll be better equipped to determine whether or not the results from our experiments can easily be replicated in your garden as well. And we'll also refer back to this video in the future as a form of background information when talking about any new experiments. Plus, in the spirit of global community, we also have a bit of a favor to ask. We'd really appreciate it if you could collect these location-specific details about yourself as well, and then share them in the comments along with any growing techniques that you've attempted, either successfully or otherwise. That might give everyone else a better idea of where these techniques have succeeded or failed around the world. And we figure if nothing else, this will give us a fun way to get to know each other just a little bit better. Okay, so let's get started. One of the first things that people typically ask us about is our plant hardiness zone. And for good reason. It's a simple number that tells you a lot about your local climate and the types of plants that can be successfully grown in your area. There are a number of different systems used around the world, but the de facto standard was developed by the United States Department of Agriculture. The USDA scale is broken down into 13 zones based on the extreme minimum temperature reached in that geographical area during winter. Each zone represents a 10 degree range from minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit to plus 70 degrees Fahrenheit, as well as subzones of 5 degree ranges. For example, zone 5 represents all locations with a minimum temperature between minus 10 and minus 20. Whereas zone 5B refers to areas with minimum temperatures between minus 10 and minus 15. So if you live in the US, then determining your zone is as straightforward as visiting the USDA website and either entering your zip code or clicking on the interactive map. But for the rest of us, it gets a bit more complicated. For example, in some countries like Canada, we also have our own standard that takes much more information into account, like frost, rainfall, snow depth, average wind speeds, etc. It's a pretty detailed equation, but in the end, it spits out a simple zone number, and Natural Resources Canada has a similar map on their website as well. But unfortunately, though the USDA and NRCAN zones look the same, they're not. For example, here in our part of eastern Ontario, our NRCAN zone is 5B, but on the USDA scale, we're zone 4B. And the difference is important, because every time you purchase a packet of seeds or a seedling from the nursery, the tag indicates which zone that species will tolerate. And unfortunately, if the relevant scale isn't clearly marked, then you could end up with some pretty disappointing results. And the problem's even more pronounced when talking to others online. Chances are that most zone references on the internet will be using the USDA scale, but it's always best to confirm if possible. Conveniently, the 1990 version of the USDA map also includes Canada and Mexico, so we can compare both maps for reference. But if you're outside of North America, then honestly, Google seems to be your best bet. Because there are plenty of websites with interactive USDA zone maps for every other part of the world, but as usual, Google does a decent job of parsing through it all and providing an answer. The next important piece of information is the length of our growing season, or in other words, the number of days when it's reliably possible to successfully grow plants outside. Once again, this is defined differently depending on where you're located. For example, here in North America, we calculate the growing season based on the number of days between the last frost in spring and the first frost in fall. It's defined slightly differently in Europe by counting the days in which the average temperature never drops below 5 degrees Celsius. But then there are the hotter parts of the world, like the tropics and deserts, where instead of being concerned about temperature, they're instead usually based on the availability of water. The Farmer's Almanac seems to be a reliable source of these dates for Canada and the US, but once again, Google seems to be a quick solution for pretty much everywhere else. So in our case, our last frost date is April 29th, and our first frost date is October 6th, 
which gives us a total growing season of 159 days. This is a good piece of information because it not only helps you determine when you should be starting your seeds, but also what types of vegetables you'll actually have time to grow all the way to maturity. Another important value is our average annual rainfall. Because we often point out that a lot of our experiments require no watering whatsoever, and that we rely entirely on precipitation from the sky, moisture retention from our mulch and buried wood, and more recently, a tiny bit of water concentration from the mini swale trenches in our newest garlic bed. But none of that would be possible if we didn't receive sufficient quantities of rainfall during the growing season. So once again, all we need to do is Google it, and in our case, our average annual precipitation is 889 millimeters, with 388 of that falling as rain during the growing season. And the final piece of information that we can obtain online is our elevation. Again, Google makes this pretty fast and efficient. Simply type the location followed by the word elevation and voila. If you live someplace really remote, then you may have to use the closest town or city instead, but it should still be accurate enough for our purposes. However, for those living in mountainous regions, the elevation could considerably shorten your growing season and change your hardiness zone entirely. So in any case, our elevation is 107 meters above sea level. All right, now for the fun stuff. So far, everything we've covered has kept us pretty connected to the internet, but for the rest, let's get our hands dirty and make some direct observations. We'll start with an easy one the sun. In our case, our garden is in full sun all day. So throughout the season, we receive about 11 to 16 hours of sunlight. The direct impacts of sun and shade are pretty obvious for the most part, but it can also make a tremendous difference on water retention and evaporation. So I figured it was worth mentioning, especially when talking about the benefits of techniques like sheet mulching. Next is about our soil because we've gone to great lengths to avoid bringing in new earth from off the property, instead choosing to build our own soil over time using natural methods. Once again, it would be helpful to gather a bit of information about our starting point, so we've decided to check our pH value and our soil composition as well. Now, we'll be posting a couple of follow-up videos about how we actually performed these tests, so watch for those soon. But essentially, using a pH meter, we were able to determine that, depending on where you check, our soil is typically between 6 and 7. 7.5, which is pretty much a neutral pH, but places us towards the higher end of the ideal range. And using the mason jar test, we determined that our soil composition is sandy loam, which is pretty much what we had assumed. And finally, let's talk about unwelcome visitors. Because it's funny how we tend to get used to dealing with the native species in our area, but it completely blows our mind when we hear what other people have to deal with. For example, that's how we felt when we first read that many of you have to routinely contend with wild boars. Anyway, needless to say, we don't have that problem here. But we do have an abundance of white-tailed deer, wild turkeys, rabbits, raccoons, groundhogs, squirrels, mice, voles, and crows. We also have aphids, Japanese beetles, vine weevils, cutworms, Colorado potato beetles, squash bugs, grasshoppers, and cabbage worms. And of course, we also have the usual slugs and snails. Luckily, most of the creepy crawlers have been little more than an annoyance, but for our furry and feathered friends, it's another story. We've had to erect a small scarecrow for the birds, and of course, we're still working on that fence. But luckily, despite our huge number of mice and voles, we've not yet had any of the issues with our Ruth Stout potatoes that some of you have reported. So either we've just been extremely lucky, or something else in our garden conditions has unknowingly helped us out behind the scenes. For example, perhaps the rodents were deterred by the row of onions we planted on the outside edge of our garden bed. Or maybe our definition of a lot of mice is a bit different than that of others. But if you have any theories about that, please let us know. That's all the information that we could come up with about our garden. But if we've missed anything, or if you'd like any further details, please leave us a comment and we'll do our best to follow up. We really hope this was useful to some of you, and again, we'd really appreciate if you could share your details with everyone else as well. Oh yeah, and don't forget to check back soon for our standalone soil test videos as well. But in the meantime, thanks for watching, and we'll see you again soon.